Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar, Reforming the Charcoal Sector. What does it mean and who does it benefit? I'm Sylvia Herzog from the Charcoal Project. Uh, we're happy to be presenting this webinar as part of our ongoing series on um, working towards a more sustainable uh, charcoal uh, for fuel. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, Sioni, if you want to forward the slide. Um, just if you could please keep your microphone and camera off for now. Um, we are going to have a Q&A session at the end, but we'll be using the chat box to pose the questions uh, because there'll be too many people on to unmute everyone. Uh, afterwards, um, after the presentation, we'll be providing you with the recording and the corresponding slides that, uh, that go with the recording. Uh, we'll also be answering any questions that were submitted in the chat that we're not that we didn't have time to get to. So um, that's actually a pretty useful write up of the chat. Um, just a quick overview of who the charcoal project is. I know a number of you, uh, most of you probably know who we are, but for those of you who are new to us, we're a nonprofit based in the US and we focus on advocating for better fuels uh, and technologies for people who rely on biomass fuel for their everyday energy needs. We do that by supporting uh, entrepreneurs through our Harvest Fuel Initiative. Um, we also have an online, uh, a lot of online resources at www.charcoalproject.org. Um, and we also advocate for more sustainable practices for wood fuel consumption production, like through today's uh, webinar. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over to our moderator, Dr. Chiani Mwampamba, who is a researcher with a lot of background in charcoal at, in, in Mexico. Uh, she's Tanzanian by birth, um, so she brings a lot of experience uh, to her role. She's also on the board of the Charcoal Project, so we benefit from her expertise every day. Um, and with that, I'm going to let uh, Chiani take over. Thank you, Chiani. Tiani, I think you're on mute. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being here, for attending this uh, third webinar that the Charcoal Project is hosting uh, with the idea of um, really trying to better understand the different charcoal narratives that are out there, the different issues around charcoal, um, and educate each other about um, what, what the charcoal issues are and, and what are the different ways and approaches uh, for addressing uh, the problems where problems exist. So uh, today we have a wonderful set of panel, a, a panel with uh, three main uh, speakers. We have uh, Shia Zuzang, a forestry, uh, he's a forestry officer at the Forestry Division, uh, Wood Energy uh, of FAO. And he, uh, and, and you may know that FAO has uh, been promoting uh, the whole concept of transitioning and, and moving the charcoal sector from a, a, an unsustainable to more sustainable um, domain. And uh, he will be talking to us about those efforts and, and, and FAO's uh, role in that as a, as a multilateral organ organization. Uh, then we have uh, Professor Bernard Mork. He is the director of um, uh, DRIP. Uh, DRIP is the, um, oh, <laughs> let me remember again. DRIP is the department of, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's lost. Director I have it in another research, slide. Innovation Please tell and me. Partnership. Sorry? Director of Research, Innovation, and Partnership. That's right, thank you. At the Jaramogi Oginga Odinga University of Science and Technology in Kenya. He's had a lot of experience uh, with um, Kenya's uh, work and reforming its biofuel and bioenergy sector. And he will talk to us about that. And then we have uh, Dr. Papa Faye. He's uh, currently a qualitative research and migration expert at the World uh, Bank in uh, Dakar, Senegal. But he's also the co-founder and um, uh, executive secretary of a really interesting initiative uh, in, 
in Dakar, Senegal, that he will talk to us about. And he looks at sort of the human rights dimensions of policy, policy reform and practice in Senegal. So we really have a, a very different um, takes and very different approaches to what reform means and what are its possible repercussions uh, in once uh, it's being implemented. So um, I just want to give a little bit of background so we're all sort of on the same page when, uh, when we think about reform before I invite each one of the speakers to give um, their short presentation, which will be followed by a half hour uh, Q&A session. We really want to be able to hear your questions and discuss the topic. So reforming the charcoal sector, and we're going to about, talk about it mostly in the context of the African continent. What does it mean and who does it benefit? And when we think of reform, we're really talking about changes that are occurring either at national, district, regional level, um, and, and changes in either the structure, the practices, the institutions around the charcoal sector or that, that um, that are involved in the charcoal sector with the idea that something's not working, no? that, that it's not functioning and so some kind of changes are needed. And the shape and design and, and nature of those changes um, can, can vary substantially. No? And the idea really behind today's uh, webinar and the set of panelists that we've invited is to get a much better understanding how reform is conceptualized by different actors um, and, 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 and what, what does it mean for different, for different actors and for different countries and for different regions and districts within countries to begin to appreciate the complexity of what it means to actually uh, implement reform. It is no easy feat, uh, as um, experience has shown over and over again. And then, uh, if time allows, um, to start exploring what might be alternatives to this idea sort of, of a top-down way of addressing the charcoal sectors in different, in different countries. Uh, and the big question is uh, not just what is reform, who does it affect, and, um, and so forth, but it's also why. Why is it that we talk about reform consistently when we are talking about the charcoal sector? And um, I'll go through this very fast because I think all of you are very, very much aware of why there is an environmental concern about the charcoal sector in Africa. Um, charcoal and wood fuels more generally are a huge and important energy source for cooking and heating, much more so than any other continent. Um, while in the rest of the world, about 50% of round wood production is used for wood fuels in Africa, it's 90%. 27% of that is converted into charcoal. And a lot of this wood is from natural forests, usually without uh, formal management plans. And so there is huge concerns about the sustainability of the feedstock, the sustainability of the sector in terms of environment, climate change, emissions, and so forth. You know? so, so we all know that story. And then on top of that, we also know that the trend in Africa is on the increase, while in other, other um, parts of the world, charcoal consumption and production is tapering off, or charcoal production rather, in Africa since basically the independence uh, in the 1960s, um, the, 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 the trend has been a continuous increase with no signs of really tapering off. And so if you layer that on top of the fact that um, we're not having more forests, uh, then there is cause for concern. But uh, in addition to the, to the environmental uh, issues and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the concern with the sustainability, the environmental sustainability, there are also uh, reasons to reform because of socioeconomic, uh, particularly socioeconomic reasons. And uh, we know that a lot of the charcoal that's produced, uh, and tra it's produced and traded without permits up to 99% of, of the sector in some countries occurs in the informal domain, which means, which generates basically a, a lot of challenges for any government that um, is trying to get more revenue coming out of its natural resources. 
it's a very extremely difficult sector to monitor because it occurs in this sort of gray market um, domain. And thus, we have very unreliable information about exactly what it entails, which makes it very difficult to plan for. You know? um, in addition to that, um, there is the risk that, and, and there have been, there have been a, a lot of... Um, a lot of studies as well that have shown of injustices occurring along that charcoal, the charcoal value chain uh, from child labor to abuse of power to corruption. Um, and so those are things that, that uh, would call for wanting to reform. And necessarily look pretty uh, in some cases and that there is this risk because of this informality about it of um, social uh, social uh, justice issues coming uh, being uh, being very much an issue in the in the sector and so when you hear this and if this is a narrative of charcoal that you get then of course you're out there screaming and asking for reform a total overhaul of the system um, but I think we need to um, do this carefully because there have been experiences with reform and they've had mixed results. And they've had mixed results, uh, in other words, not always successful and oftentimes unsuccessful um, because the charcoal sector is complex. And, but just because it's complex doesn't mean it's unorganized. It's actually a very efficient system. Um, and when you enter and try to shift or change something in there, you're, it's, it's a very interconnected system, so you can have repercussions in unintended places. There are huge stakes involved, big players, lots of money, millions of dollars. Um, the, 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 the trade is, is worth millions of dollars in, 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 in all the different countries in which it's a big, it's a big uh, player. Hundreds, thousands of contracts going on, uh, lots of people hired working within the sector along the chain. In Kenya, for example, 700,000 people estimated to be working in the charcoal sector alone. Um, and they are, they are um, making, they're, they're the sort of the primary earners of, and able to support dependents, up to 2.5 million dependents. So we are, this is, this is no small feat. Uh, and then we have other narratives that come along that we, that we need to think about as well, that just because something informal does not necessarily mean it's absent of norms. Um, great studies from Julien Schura um, and, and, and several other people who've looked at how reform has panned out, and particularly in the forestry sector, um, it can create new elites. It can exacerbate those who are already marginalized by making barriers to enter into the charcoal into the charcoal sector or to produce charcoal and so and, and undercut traditional institutions that work and so eventually we need to we need to also look at the other side of the coin where it can end up reform can end up just reshuffling um, and, and, and changing who are the winners and losers but not necessarily addressing the bigger problem so today uh, we will start with Shia Zuzang, forestry officer at FAO. Then we'll, another talk will be followed by Professor Bernard Mwok, uh, who will um, share with us his experiences on, on charcoal reform in Kenya in particular. And then we'll end with uh, Dr. Papa Faye with um, his very uh, insightful look at how the charcoal reform has taken place in uh, the case of Senegal. Uh, so. Zia, I'm going to stop sharing and um, please go ahead. You can um, ah, perfect. All along the way, you can um, include your chats. Uh, you include your question in the chats. We will be uh, looking at those and collating them for the Q and A section. Go ahead, Zia. We cannot hear you. Shia? Yeah. 
You just need to unmute. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, wonderful, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. It's very nice to see you and to welcome you. And thanks to the Chaco Project for organizing this webinar, which I think is really very interesting to me. And uh, no, I have been working for a field uh, on energy, wood energy issues for in the past six years. So it's really uh, great to have the chance to just uh, share some of my observations or reflection about uh, charcoal issues in developing countries. Of course, this is a more a personal uh, you know, observation, I mean, not necessarily representing FAO, which I'm currently working on. So I would like to start with, you know, FAO's work on wood energy. As some of you may know that FAO has been working on this subject for a long time. It actually is just among a few international organizations that has been working on wood energy issues in general and wood charcoal issues in particular ever since 1970s. So I just put here some of these uh, earlier publications about wood for fuel, uh, wood for energy. And in 1980s, there were some studies on charcoal issues, particularly for this, for example, this kind of simple technology for charcoal making. This was published in 1983 and repri reprinted a couple of times, which is uh, among the top downloaded publications of FAO Forest Department. And there are also some industrial charcoal making technologies. And recently we have uh, studies on the charcoal transition and how to bring in the charcoal value chains and also looking into the incentive to promote sustainable wood energy, particularly in the sub-Saharan Africa. I feel working on this you know, simply because you know, the wood energy or the energy use of wood it has been a great share in the Puto uh, uh, forest product. I mean, the round wood extracted from the, from the forest. I mean, globally about 50, so 90% in Africa, this is so big a concern. And also it's linked to the forest degradation and deforestation, and also the ecological services of forest ecosystems. And in fact, the livelihood of the large number of population and also have impact on the greenhouse gas emissions and also linked to many SDGs. So I've also worked in the past in the past the different kinds of uh, subjects and like so the policy studies or case studies at different levels, including the global level and in developing countries and also industrialized countries. And the regional level, including those wood energy status, uh, outlook of the policy studies covering Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the European countries. Now also some studies on the sustainability issues like the criteria and indicators, what forms the sustainable wood fuels with key studies. And recently, there was about the climate change, the links between the wood fuel and uh, climate change with the key studies in different regions. There was quite some major project at the national or regional level. And the very first one and over uh, almost 20 million is the Fieldwood Development for Energy in Sudan. Uh, this funding is from uh, the government of Netherlands. And later on, there is a uh, first plantation for energy and uh, rural, uh, and rural development in Peru and also a regional wood energy development program in Asia covering 16 countries. All these have a, a funding size of more than 10 million uh, US dollars. And recently we have some smaller uh, projects, which also uh, some still ongoing. Like the forest management for sustainable charcoal value in Uganda is funded by the EU, uh, about 5 million euro. 
and it's a project on the forest energy resource in Ghana, and also the uh, sustainable production of charcoal and the uh, training for livelihood in Somalia as a part of the multiple UN uh, agency projects. And uh, some other projects are smaller, but here are the major projects I mean, in terms of the funding size. Some of my observations, you know, we have been working, and many organizations have been working on this kind of wood energy issues, tech issues for a long time. Why is this still a big problem, a big concern right now? And my personal observation that, you know, in many countries, we rely heavily on this wood fuel or charcoal simply, you know, because there's a limited options or the limited alternatives as a cooking fuel. At least this is a situation in the short term or even medium term in many countries. And the recent report on tracking SDG found that you know, the progress with the SDG 7, uh, target 7.1.2 universal access to clean cooking is really very slow. I mean, globally, if you look into the numbers of the clean cooking access to clean cooking, in 2000, year 2000, about half the world population have access. And by 2018, only 33. So there's an increase of 13% over 18 years. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the percentage is 10% in 2000 and 15% in 2018. That means 5% growth over the same period of 18 years. In other words, if we will target at universal access to clean cooking by 2030, 85% to be achieved in Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa and in less than 10 years. So this will be a big challenge. I'm not sure how many of us will believe that this target will be achieved by, by that time, but at least for the time being, if no bot action and the business as rural may not have much. Also, another concern is the unsustainable sourcing of wood. I mean, the wood for charcoal production, particularly in areas closer to the major urban market, there's a big uh, impact on the forest ecosystems because the heavily reliance on the natural forests. There's, you know, so far there's, you know, the dedicated plantations of wood for charcoal production is really very limited. Another concern is the poor performance of the charcoal kings and the charcoal burning stoves. I mean, the, the conversion efficiency is low and the thermal efficiency of the stoves is not good. And there's a concern of the, of the uh, smoke and uh, the health impact. Uh, also, you know, the distribution of the benefit along the, uh, through the, the, the charcoal value chains, I mean, the different players, the benefits from different players are really, you know, a concern. Some, the, the landowners, the wood cutters, the charcoal makers, the traders, are they all have different share of this kind of benefit. Also, a uh, major concern is uh, the effectiveness of the governance of the charcoal center. This, is, this, is, this, is, this policy is not always available and not always consistent and may not be enforced. enforced. So all this lead to the consequences of the social, economic and environmental uh, impact. So in response to this, and the countries have uh, uh, some kind of a policy responses uh, you know, one of the responses that many of us know is the charcoal ban. It's just as a ban the production or transportation or the, or the market trade of charcoal. This happened in different countries, uh, sometimes not always, but at some um, at time of uh, some year, they try to ban it. And so this happened. Also, uh, you know, the, if not a complete ban, we try to set some kind of restrictions, the restrictions about the production, or if the production is, or maybe the trade only, and it's produced from some other countries, but you can 
and treat. And so, so this involves the, the permit of charcoal production and the quota or the what kind of wood species you can use for charcoal, what kind of tree you can, uh, you can, you can use for charcoal production. And later on, there are some kind of you know, initiatives about the certification of charcoal and the legally produced charcoal that involves in the lessons for differential taxation and also recently the participatory guarantee systems. In some countries where you know, the wood plantations, dedicated plantations for charcoal production, I think like in the case of Brazil and Ethiopia or Rwanda. And also in you know, the efficiency improvement of charcoal kings and, and the stoves has been in several countries, you know, like Kenya, uh, Uganda, and uh, other countries. And also the introduction of the alternatives like the liquefied petroleum gas, uh, the electricity or biogas. And in some uh, countries, they try to introduce a, a, a national strategy on charcoal, like in the case of, uh, in the case of Malawi. Malawi have just formulated a national charcoal uh, strategy for the for 10 years from 2017 to 2027. So this may help the, the country to have a better uh, coordinated policy responses. And some of the problems with the implementation of such policies, you know, one of that is the difficulties with the policy enforcement. I mean, so not all the policies are really enforced. This part, it could be because of the capacity, the institutional capacity, or could be the cost implications. And also there's difficulties with the cross sector coordination of different agencies, the government agencies, and they're not really well coordinated. And you know, also the, the data support for the decision making is weak. I mean, the, the decision makers needed to make the decision with or without the adequate data support. And the data for, uh, for the charcoal for wood fuel as the informal sector is kind of weak. So this also affects this, you know, the, the decision processes. And all this provides this kind of disincentives for investment in the wood energy or the charcoal sector because of the, the risks, the uncertainties with the charcoal investment. So some of the, you know, the, the, the interventions, how effective are they? I mean, charcoal ban may not uh, necessarily work. I and mean, actually in many cases, it doesn't work. Particularly if charcoal is for the subsistence, I mean, if you really want this kind of charcoal ban works, you really need to ensure that alternatives are available, affordable, and reliable. And, you know, the trying to, in many cases, the charcoal ban could be a, a piecemeal solution because right now it's a bigger problem. Let's, let's, let's try not to, to produce charcoal, but, you know, we really need to think about this, you know, from the holistic uh, perspectives and looking into the whole value chain. And the effectiveness in terms of reducing demand. So one of the, uh, you know, the, the, the approaches is just uh, trying to cut down the demand for charcoal. If there is no demand, you know, people will not produce so many charcoal. It's, so this, like the, the, the clean, efficient stoves and the fuel substitution or transition to the other alternatives, it helps a lot in cutting down the demand for charcoal. But this is context specific, may not always work. And if people have to use charcoal and are trying to see you know, if it's how to make the charcoal production more sustainable to enhance the charcoal supply capacity, like, you know, to enhance the sustainable forest management, the effective use of the wood residues or the dedicated plantations, including also the 
the improvement of the efficiency, the conversion efficiency. So the the this is a mixed result. In you know, some countries, been pretty good, and some not really very success. I mean, the, the, the bottom line, the people trying to uh, you know to ensure is to minimize the disturbance to the primary forest from the charcoal production. So in this case, a stronger regulations and enforcement of wood sourcing will be important. So some of the recommendations, uh, this is you know, the different recommendation for different audience. This recommendations uh, actually you know, we proposed it to the African Forestry and Weather Lab Commission uh, last year. One of the uh, recommendations to recognize the value and importance of charcoal in meeting the increasing demand for the affordable and reliable cooking fuels from the urban areas. This is a particular situation in African countries. As this has a, a strong uh, impact and environmental consequences on the land degradation, the climate change and the rural livelihood. And for some countries, we have heavy reliance on the wood fuel and charcoal. Uh, it's, it is recommended to think about the formulation and uh, national charcoal strategy to prioritize the coordinate actions for sustainable charcoal production. And it is important to create an enabling environment just to provide incentives for the sustainable charcoal production, including those kind of regulations of wood sourcing and the efficient wood charcoal conversion and technologies. And in areas where the, the, the situation you know, is, is good enough to think about the feasibility of establishing a dedicated woodlot plantation for charcoal production. This could be the case for the major urban area where a big demand for wood charcoal exists. And also trying to identify and disseminate the good practices of a relevant national or uh, regional programs, policies, and regulations. I think my time is up. I just to thank you for your attention, back to doing it. Thank you so much, Xia. Uh, yes, indeed, FAO has been around for a long time. Uh, it's sort of one, been one of the consistent uh, organizations that um, that synthesizes information on charcoal and research on charcoal, and we're very, very happy to have all these documents available on the FAO website to um, get a really um, angle on all the, all the different issues, and particularly um, how, how um, it's promoting, uh, trying to get this coordinated effort across sectors to address the charcoal issue at country level. Um, then our next speaker is Professor Mork and he'll be talking to us about that experience in Kenya. And it's a very recent experience. Um, the biomass strategy for Kenya was actually launched last year, I believe. Uh, but there's also a biofuel energy policy that, um, that we might hear about. Go ahead, Professor. Can you? Yeah, there. Can you hear us? Yes. Ah, yes. Uh, please, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much to Yanni for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I want to say greeting from Kenya. I don't want to attempt to say morning or evening or night because we are from different continents. Um, I'm, I'm glad to share with you the experience in Kenya and uh, East Africa on, on charcoal. Uh, I'm going to first look at uh, that uh, to mention that charcoal means different things to different people in this continent. And uh, there's never been such a time when uh, a fuel has been so demonized in Africa and indeed in the world than what is happening to, to, to charcoal. I think you have gone a little bit fast. Uh, if you could take me back to page two, please, yeah. So I want to look at some, when you talk about charcoal and you are East Africa, what do people think and what, what, what comes to your memory? One 
charcoal actually is associated with the, with the conflict and civil wars. And there's just some bullet points there that you can see. And I just want to read the, the, for the last one that uh, charcoal is feeling Somali conflict. And the same thing has been mentioned in the Congo Basin and many areas. The trade of charcoal is actually been a source of conflict for, for in, in East Africa. Then on uh, the, the next page, uh, the next page, yes. Charcoal is also causing, sorry, the, the spelling is a, a diplomatic role. And uh, we are probably aware of the, how the Kenyan forces in uh, keeping keeping forces uh, keeping peace forces in uh, Somalia were associated with the charcoal trade, and this was uh, actually it went to the United Nations Security Council. And uh, following that, uh, also the United Nations Security Council actually banned uh, charcoal charcoal importation from 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 uh, from Somalia. So charcoal is not just a household fuel, but it's also gone to uh, to the gone to the diplomatic levels. In the next one, the next slide. Uh, this is well known, and uh, I, I'll say very little on this, that uh, charcoal is also very much associated with the environmental degradation in Kenya, in Uganda, in Tanzania, and these are just a few of the, the, the headlines. Actually, what I'm reading here and the news headline, what I picked from the news and what they're saying about the charcoal, including the, the civil war and the conflict in East Africa. And here I say Congo gorilla killings fueled by illegal charcoal trade in DRC, Congo. In Somalia, say Somali's charcoal trade is uh, filling acacia demise, which is uh, quite serious because you know when you're looking at the horn of Af Africa, acacia is the dominant vegetation, and if this is being uh, threatened by, by by charcoal, then that means a big catastrophe in terms of uh, environment. Uh, in Congo, again, the Virunga National Park is also being threatened by by by, by charcoal. In Tanzania. The Miombo woodland, for those who know that, uh, Miombo woodland is one of the largest woodland formation in Africa and supporting millions of life. And Miombo woodland is also being threatened by charcoal production. Really bad um, you know, publicity for charcoal, yeah? The next one. Yeah, still on, on, on charcoal. You mentioned that uh, if charcoal is sustainably produced, we can be able to get a neutral, a carbon neutral, can be carbon neutral. Because charcoal that you produce and you use it, uh, you know, you use it for cooking, the same trees you, you, you are planting can also sequestrate carbon, charcoal, the carbon. And charcoal can potentially be neutral, carbon neutral. But what we, have, we are using right now is really not uh, carbon neutral. And if we have to look at the issues of climate change, then it's very, very important that we look at how charcoal is produced, how charcoal is, uh, is transported, and uh, how charcoal is used. With more than 2 billion users of traditional charcoal in the world, the energy savings and emission reduction from charcoal can also be very, very potential. You know, with all those uses, and you can imagine the amount of emission that they are, they are emitting to the, to, the, to the atmosphere. And if that can be controlled and can be used sustainably, then we are, we are looking at really potential reduction in the carbon emission. Mm -hmm. To some others, I've just mentioned about the conflicts in Africa. I've mentioned about uh, the environment in Africa, but to some others, charcoal is a black gold. And actually these are some of the the news items that you can just Google and find the news, news houses are reporting on charcoal. That around the world, charcoal has been considered as the energy source and retained an equal dominance. So around the world, charcoal is so, so dominant. In Africa, the situation is no different. And actually, 40% of uh, charcoal produced Africa found their way into European market. Uh, and the big countries uh, that are producing charcoal, like uh, Nigeria, Egypt, Namibia, South Africa, Tanzania is also one of the big producers are earning a lot in terms of revenue in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in charcoal. So charcoal is a big business in Sub-Saharan Africa and it's something that we really, really can't ignore. 
income that you get from charcoal and everything can, be, can contribute so much into GDP of, 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 of Africa. Unfortunately, on the other side, that uh, a lot of uh, income from charcoal don't get their, don't reach the, the national GDP uh, data because a lot of this is being done illegally. So the mainstream charcoal is very little, but when you look at the more of illegal charcoal, you know, uh, then there's some, so much that is producing and people are, don't take this into account. Yeah. You want to move to the next, yeah. So these are just some of, some of the figures looking at uh, what the energy, uh, energy agency, international energy agency is putting up and the millions of people that are still relying on, on charcoal. In the last sentence, they say, in, with the, this prediction, the economy value of the charcoal interest may exceed 12 billion, Euro, billion US dollars by 2030 and employing 12 million people. This is actually a big industry. It's an industry that we can't avoid, even though we are trying to paint it uh, so bleak, but uh, I think uh, it's a high time that we recognize charcoal for what it is. And in the next statement there, this is uh, data from World Bank. That's showing us that uh, about uh, 350 job, day, job days per, uh, per terabyte, charcoal is, is creating a lot of jobs compared to other energy sources like LPGs, kerosene, and other sources of electricity. And you can see the figures around uh, charcoal, there are 350 compared to electricity, 80 to 110. And then LPG gas, LP gas is uh, 10 to 20, and kerosene is only 20. So in terms of, in terms of, uh, of uh, the, the job creation, then we also can't uh, ignore charcoal. Actually, I wanted to mention that uh, a lot of people, the professors that you see in Africa, the engineers, you know, the doctors, the architects, these are people who actually went to school through the revenue income from, from charcoal. And without charcoal, a lot of people in Africa would not have gone to school or been where they are today. So again, charcoal is very important. And you can see the figures in the last bullet there, how much Kenya is earning in terms of charcoal, $450 million per year. Tanzania is in higher, $600 million per year. And Rwanda has also got the same figures. So charcoal is a big thing in Africa. It's an income earner and it's something that we can ignore. I think we are going back, maybe go forward. But this, though charcoal is playing a, very, a, big, a big role, yeah. For charcoal to play its rightful role in the economy, then we need a lot of reform. I mentioned here that a lot of uh, income for charcoal are not being captured in the national figures, in the regional figures and local figures, you know, on, on the economy, the economic development, because most, most of it are, are in uh, informal sectors and uh, nobody's keep, keep, keeping the figures. So it's very important for charcoal to, to have a charcoal sector reform. And some of the, the areas that we are looking at and problems that we are having in Africa is that Africa, the charcoal sector reform in Africa is not following the right procedure. Many a times they're looking at a reductionary mentality and actually my previous, uh, previous presenter had looked at the bans. And you can see if you look at the papers and look at the newspapers and uh, the news, news headlines, you look of charcoal ban, like the first one here, you see two years ago, Kenya banned, the, you know, banned charcoal. And this didn't solve the problem. Actually, after banning charcoal, people just cross across the borders and they went into Uganda, causing the same problems that, uh, that, they, are, that, that they are causing right now. Uh, in, in Tanzania in 2018, Tanzania also banned charcoal. So different countries are banning charcoal at different times, depending on the convenience. It depends on who is there on power, who is the minister for energy, for example, or who is the nature minister for environment. And this is not really, really sustainable. I agree with the, with the previous presenter that ban, if you're using ban as the policy, then we are not going to getting it right because it depends on who is in, in power at that time. And once that person leaves, then nobody else is following up. There's also problem of leadership in charcoal. That's why charcoal, charcoal sector reform becomes difficult that uh, in different countries, uh, charcoal are controlled by different departments and different sectors. 
So you find maybe in Kenya, charcoal is being addressed by the Ministry of Environment. The Ministry of Energy also want to put a hand on charcoal and different countries are also having all those different. So leadership in charcoal is still a bit of a problem and this is affecting formalization and reforms in, in charcoal sector. There's also the vested interest. And, and Kenya is a, it's a very good example in that uh, there this big uh, you know, expanse uh, forest cover, the Mau forest. And this is where a lot of charcoal burning is happening, production is happening. And uh, for the politicians, uh, because the community around that place have got a lot of votes. So when the politicians can always talk, but when it comes around the election time, then nobody will talk about charcoal because you're going to miss the votes. So there's also the political interest that is also giving problems to, to reforms in the charcoal sector because you are going to lose your, your, your influence among the, the population. And that goes hand in hand with the weak governance system. So we just mentioned that a lot of countries don't have policy in, in, in charcoal, they don't have regulation in charcoal, and they keep on using ban or unban, ban and ban, and that is not really sustainable. Uh, there's also a problem because charcoal production is mainly from the forests and woodlands. And unless we also address the area, the, the issue of benefit sharing with the communities, then the community still uh, will not take charcoal, you know, the, those forests as their own because they have to look at a way how the benefit can be shared. Yes, the next one. So why do we need uh, reforms in charcoal sector? We have just mentioned the, the, the challenges facing reforms in charcoal sector. So uh, what we, there's all evidence that uh, charcoal is going to stay with us for the near future. Um, looking at what's happening in the energy world and the energy mix in Africa, charcoal and indeed the biomass is still going to be with us. Today. So we really can't run away from it. The best way is to more of a streamline it and also put it in the, in the formal sector. Uh, then we also the problem, the alternatives, the prices keep on fluctuating, the fossil fuels keep on fluctuating, electricity is not, is not, you know, uh, is not, is not reliable. So this still means that uh, biomass, including charcoal and firewood, will still play a big role. And so we really have to think of how we are going to reform the sector so that the sector can play its role. Uh, the other one there is climate change calls for enhanced forest management, mitigation and, and adaptation. And that follows with the, with the last one that is reduce, reducing global carbon emission to net zero because the world now is looking at uh, a net zero from energy by 2050, which is actually in line with the 1.5 uh, temperature target. And this call for nothing less than a, a complete transformation of how we produce energy generally, and including charcoal, how we produce charcoal how we transport charcoal and how we, we consume it. A lot of time that you look at the policies and because I'm telling you it's more of sectoral policies. For example, Kenya, the only regulation, the regulation that was uh, done was done by the, uh, through the, the, uh, the Kenya Forest Services. And they were more of interested in the production line. So how are you going to sustainable production? Nobody was talking about transport. Nobody was talking about how it's, it is used at the household level. Yes, let's move. Yes, so I mentioned that uh, Africa and East Africa actually is following different policy uh, paths. And there are mainly three policy paths that, uh, that, are, that are picked here. That, uh, the most common system is uh, in Sahel countries and central regulation. And with the central regulation, the government decide but they also have decentralized systems where the villagers and the communities are also playing a big role. So in the Sahel region, you look at like more of a, of, of, a, of a hybrid system where the government is playing a big role, the central system is playing, playing a big role, but at the same time, the communities are also a big, a big, a big a major role to play. In East Africa and Southern Africa, in contrast, it's more of central regulation and the government actually calls the shots. And that happens in Kenya, that's happened in Tanzania, that's happened, that's why you find this ban, there's no ban, and all this is happening. Well, there's been a movement in the, in the, in the recent past that uh, 
the East African are also trying to look at the centralized system mechanism, decentralized mechanism. And the way that they look at this is through participatory forest management. When Kenya, Tanzania, and some of these other countries introduce participatory management and through community forest association, then now they were allowed to take part in the forest and they were also allowed to extract uh, you know, wood that uh, wood fuel for, for their use. So there was that movement, but largely is still very, very much depend on the central, central system. Yes. So what are the approaches to, to sector reform that uh, we could work? First, we have to think of formalization and uh, modernization of the forest of, of, the, of the charcoal sector. We have recognized that uh, charcoal sector is playing a big role and there's no way that is can be uh, ignored. So because it's there with us, then we have to think of formalizing it and also modernizing. And when I mean modernizing, then we have to think of how we use charcoal at household level, how we, we, we produce charcoal, are you using the traditional, because a lot of people are still using the traditional system of charcoal burning, which is very, very wasteful. And then we also have to consider the whole value chain. Uh, and I mentioned that uh, se forest sector is a sector that cuts between different uh, departments and different ministries. And so each ministry is only interested on the, their part of value chain, what they're addressing. But for us to address charcoal, we have to look at an approach that is actually going to address the whole value chain. And that is very important. Then we also need consultation with affected stakeholders, especially if charcoal has to work for the ordinary people, the common people, then we have to also have to listen to them. The fact that the government will see it and produce regulations, a lot of times these regulations have not worked for the small people, the traders, small traders that are actually earning their livelihoods from, from charcoal. Then we need inter, uh, integration in the national strategies. Uh, maybe that there's a lot of strategies, you know. Uh, the, the, the bioenergy strategy that uh, was talked about was produced by the Ministry of, of uh, Energy. The charcoal regulation is produced by forest department and all these are, so this need to harmonize the, and integrate the different national strategies so that they, we have one strategy that is helping us. Then we also need to innovative governance arrangements, uh, especially from the government, government. How can we involve people? How can we address the taxation problems? There's the legal, the legal taxation that ha is happening in Africa. There's also a lot of illegal taxation, especially when you introduce some of this regulation and the, the, the police and the law enforcers are using them to terrorize the, the charcoal traders and they end up paying a lot of illegal taxation. So it is also, the government also need to play a big role in the, gover in the governance of the sector and to make sure that the taxation is favoring the, the, the traders. Uh, I, I'm just taking a, a case study of Kenya and looking at the policies that have been uh, put in place for, for tax. And uh, some of them are as old as uh, 1999. That's, that's the Environment, Environment Management and Coordination Act. That's more of talking generally about uh, environmental management and conservation. But there's also the Traffic Act. That is also looking at the transportation of, of, uh, of charcoal, which is... Uh, transportation in general and also charcoal in particular. And they're the ones actually that are looking at the transporters, charcoal transporters. And this is where there's a lot of illegal taxation. Uh, there's the Energy, uh, Energy Act 2019, which is very progressive and mentioned uh, wood fuel, including charcoal as one of the sources of uh, renewable energy. Uh, in 2009, Kenya produced the first regulation, the charcoal regulation, which was based on the Forest Act 2005. And the Forest Act has been also been revised. And now we have the Forest uh, Conservation and Management Act 2016, which still recognize uh, uh, charcoal, but also it's also recognized the roles of the, of the, of the community, especially the privileges of the Community Forest Association, because these are actually the people who are actually allowed to extract charcoal from, from the, you know, to extract wood from the forest. We also have the National Energy Policy the forest, forest policy, the forest policy 2016. And at the county level, local level, different counties are also bringing up their regulation of charcoal. Countries like Titui, Geo Marakwet, and the, the list is, is growing. 
the problem that the, all these policies are not harmonized. Everybody's sitting there and having a regulation or a policy and not consulting the other. So we find that many a time they are not they are not in harmony. But the one that I want to mention here is the bioenergy strategy. This strategy started way back in 2010, 2009, 2009, and there was a bioenergy subcommittee, which I was heading, and we started by producing bioenergy fuel. It was a very, very you know, uh, consultative and, uh, and participatory project where the NGOs, the, the civil society, the government, and all the, 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 the stakeholders came together and formed a committee. And which was housed by the Ministry of Energy, but it was headed by not by the Ministry, not headed by, which was headed by me, but was selected by the, the, the stakeholders, not by the Ministry. So through this uh, committee, we have gone through a lot of stages. First, we started with the biofuel biofuel policy, and uh, the, the, what we learned was that uh, at that time it depends on those who are at the at the chairs or on the, the authority. You find that it comes a person who don't see the consider fuel, the bio, bioenergy as, as fuel as important. They're, all their interest is in electricity, for example, or pe petroleum you know, uh, products, for example. And that one took us so many, many years to come up with a bioenergy strategy, but we are happy that- For example, if he leaves the Coke Zero that's not open, I will help him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but if he opens them, then they're useless. I think so, somebody is talking, maybe could need to mute. So it took us very long to come. Oh, it was muted. So I mentioned that it took us so long to come up with the bioenergy policy because of the different interests. There was interest from the from the from the petroleum, the fossil fuel industry, the interest from electricity, and so depending on whoever was there at that time in the department, energy department. Either they listen to the petroleum side or listen to the electricity side, and many a times uh, biofuel, which all bi bioenergy remained behind. But uh, we are happy that at the end of it, by last year, this was uh, produced. We have it right now. Then the next one. Yeah, and Professor, you have uh, oops, one more minute. <laughs> yeah. Last slide. Yeah. So, in conclusion. He said that despite the importance of charcoal, very few African countries have got policies on regulation on charcoal. And this is looking at the role that charcoal is, got, is playing in Africa. It's very important that we, can, we, we, we have these this, uh, regulations and policies at the country level, but we also need it as also at, at, uh, at a cross-border level. Then when, as we make this, uh, these uh, policies, it's also very important that we take, we take a participatory approach. Uh, this is, uh, it's, some, it's a lesson that we learned from the Kenyan process, which was really, really participatory, and that enabled us, despite the, the problem, the challenges from the other sectors, we are able now to reach where we are at, at the moment. Uh, the other one there is to look at harmonizing the regulations at national level, which I mentioned, at regional level and also at international level. I mentioned the case where the government in, in Kenya would ban charcoal, but uh, the traders easily move across to the next border and go to Uganda and cause the same problems that they are causing. So if we have to move together in terms of, of, uh, of the sector reform, then we need to harmonize the regional approach and also national and international approach. Of course, I mentioned earlier that for us to really address charcoal, then we need to address the, the whole value chain, not just the production like it is right now, the Ministry of the Ministry in charge of forest is looking at production, the Ministry in charge of, of energy is looking at uh, at utilization. There's need to address it as a whole. But then also we need to look at the to monitor the value chain and look at the illicit financial flows. How can the finances from, from charcoal contribute to the to the uh, GDPs, the national GDPs, and how can that data be be be, be put be brought in? And also at the same time, we also look at areas around the corruption at high levels and also corruption at low levels. Corruption at high levels could also mean the politicians who have got uh, interest, but also at low levels, for the police and the law enforcers are also harassing charcoal traders. Then let's go move to the last uh, slide, I think, yeah. Last slide. Yeah, so, Again, just to support the policy. 
there's also need to, to, to have data. Uh, at the moment, as I mentioned, that the check hole is mainly in that in an informal sector, uh, in the informal way, informal sector. And so it's very difficult to collect data in Africa to support policy. So as we look at, uh, at policy reform, the sector reforms, then we also need to put in place a uh, mechanism that, that we can collect data from the production up to the usage. And only using this data, then we can have, have policies that can inform, you know, can inform the policies, data informed policies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mwok, for a great overview of the economic justifications for, for um, reforming the sector and then all the multiple ways one can go about it, but also just what that means for a country and especially when, and I think you're emphasizing also what Shia said earlier, uh, when all this is not harmonized. Um, so. We will now take the conversation to a, a, a very different direction. Uh, Dr. Papafai is an anthropologist, a social anthropologist, who looks at the human rights dimensions of forest policy. So welcome, Papafai. Uh, go ahead, please. Um, and if you can, I'm sorry, go just a little bit faster so that we can really have at least uh, you know, 12, 15 minutes for a good conversation with the audience. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Chiani. Uh, this is going to be fast. Uh, uh, I will try to make it short. Yeah, um, my presentation is going to focus on, on the case of Senegal. Uh, my knowledge on West African cases is very vague, so I don't want to, <coughs> to do a presentation that covers all countries. And so also I know I have very vague knowledge of, the, <coughs> of those experiences in Mali for example, in Burkina Faso. So uh, just issues of context here, just to let, let you know that uh, um, charcoal, the role, I mean, the place of charcoal in the domestic energy consumption in Senegal is about 26%. And the bowl biomass energy, would, I mean, charcoal and dead would be combined for almost 80% of domestic energy consumption, especially in rural areas uh, and secondary towns. So if you look at the national energy sourcing, of course also biomass still represents 58%. So um, that's make charcoal a strategic resource in Senegal. And the government is very careful on the supply issue and especially trying to avoid shortage. Um, but that make also a powerful union of nations. I mean, charcoal in Senegal and I will show uh, this, uh, this figure to show you how it is organized in Senegal. So here we see the surga, we call it surga lorry, which are the woodcutters. The woodcutters, uh, they are hired by patron, they call patron, which is boss, which means bosses in English. So the, the bosses sit in town, basically, majority of them are people from urban cities who hire surga, the real people, or majority of them coming from Guinea, According to my last statistic, 68% uh, came from Republic of Guinea and 37% was said what they were Senegalese. Also majority of this 37% were also uh, people coming from Guinea but who ended up sitting, I mean, having Senegalese citizenship. It's so many. Hello? Maybe. He's been a good customer. <laughs> Sorry about yeah. that. I'm going the to guy try see you, to right? mute him. Um, please go ahead. Okay, so at the forest edge, you have the surga who are the who are the the, for, the food cutters, and they are control supervised by their work is supervised by con control plus. Those control plus was are hired. Both of them are hired by the patrons that which mean the bosses. And once the charcoal is produced, it is sent to city by the transporters, which is the owners of the trucks. Uh, I, I may want to recall that the, the trucks are also, majority of the trucks that are transporting charcoal are also owned by the patrons, that means the bosses. And at, once the charcoal get in the city here, uh, the wholesalers would give it to the retailers, that is the end, actually, I mean, at the, the actors at the 
uh, end of the stage here. And then there is a second uh, also organization here, structure here, which is which has that has been introduced by a project management project here. So that is projects who have um, uh, organized villages into woodcutters, uh, chocolate producers, and those woodcutters would produce chocolate and sell it to banabanas. The banabanas are irregular merchants. That means merchants who don't have license, or they can send the, I mean, sell their products production to to the bosses here. So here is the way it is organized. And then you have the regulatory, the actors that regulate the sector, the, the national forest service, of course, and regionals and local um, forest agents also give license. And then we have the elected local government, who normally also delivers the the, the permission for chocolate to be produced within the jurisdiction. And they have also have the village committee regrouped into inter-village committees. Those have been created by a project uh, that was supposed to, to transform the chocolate, I mean, to reform the chocolate sector, and we will give you examples of them. And then you have a national union of merchants, very strong one here, who control the, the chocolate sector in Senegal. If you look at this map, for example, you see where the chocolate is produced so it is basically here in Tambacunda. You'll see the figures uh, in the next slide, how much come from here and then here. These are the two main regions where chocolate is coming from. Uh, the rest of Senegal is not that green. So the chocolate is here, the, the rest of our force <laughs> in the south and southeastern Senegal. So if you look at this chart, for example, you can see Tambacunda is producing, is where the 50% of chocolate um, feeding Senegal is, is produced. And then about 40% is also produced here in Galda. The rest is in the more or less central regions here. Oh, what does it mean, chocolate reform in Senegal? So I need, I need to uh, just remind that chocolate production before the reform started was towards quota, quota, quota based. So it is the national service, for service determining the, 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 the national construction of Senegal saying, okay, Consumption in Senegal is about 5,100 uh, chemicals of charcoal per year. And this is not scientifically based. Of course, it's not bad. It's not, it wasn't based on science, but just on esti an estimation. And that has been criticized by researchers, but also by some of the donors. And that is why um, the, the, the World Bank had decided, and many other projects, USID for example, other donors and GIZ, decided to, to help the government to, I mean, the forest service, especially the Ministry of Environment and the Energy, to, to craft a forest management plan. Forest management plan, and the expansion of forest management plan so relied on those donors to, to give funding to the government to be able to spread those forest management plan. And the forest management plan uh, would, would decide where chocolate is going to be produced as the, is the program, I mean, a planning of the, they would do an inventory of the charcoal potentials, I mean, the forest potential in terms of charcoal and the, or planning in different years of how the charcoal is going to be produced. Uh, by in 2019, uh, the, the Forest Service said they have produced 47 forest management plan. And then that's why they decided to, uh, to, to start the reform. Uh, and then one of the aspects, I mean, it was the further the first point. I mean, the decision in, in that reform was that the elimination of the system of quota. So given that they have produced 47, 47 forest management plan, they said, okay, now we know the potentials of forest, and we're going to eliminate the system of quota. So the production of charcoal per year is going to be based on the on forest potentials and uh, compared um, then they decided that chocolate production is not going to be produced in forests that do not have uh, forest management plants. It's also, they also tried to introduce what they call chocolate sale by tender, which means that, uh, um, in a real, in a, for example, in a rural jurisdiction, uh, a commune or um, a local government can decide that in, in, in a force, they will but they would sell one of the parcel or plot of force force block to by tender. I mean, to force merchants to for to produce chocolate there. So this has been a lead. Uh, this one is really not working well 
and he has been started and put into regulation just in 2018 with the new 4C code, the accuracy law that is issued. Now, the, the third point of that reform was that local, produce, uh, local producers access to urban markets. I, I said that the, 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 the chocolate sector is controlled by force, uh, urban forest nations. So those nations are organized into a big union that is called INSEF, very powerful one, and who can even provoke so chocolate shortage, artificial chocolate shortage to put, to put pressure on the government to reform or to devise to propose, to, to, to propose prices, etc. So local producers, also the project um, uh, of the World Bank or the ESID has been helping them to organize our villagers into uh, group and uh, into group organization or cooperatives to be able to enter the chocolate market has been failing to trans I mean to to enter the chocolate the urban market as it was really controlled by the, the wholesalers by the, the the urban nations because those has the the wholesalers in town they also control the retailers they also determine how much chocolate is going to get into the town per day so they really had a monopoly on everything in, in, in the cities so local producers that mean villagers wasn't able to enter the city the, the city so the project part of the reform was to make to make uh, to, to to change policies so in a way that local producers could be able to to enter the city and which is the most product lucrative market so one way of <clears throat> of going to of reaching that was to try to allocate them um uh, means of transportation that means trucks lorry trucks and the world bank for example gave uh, three lorry trucks to, to the domain regions to look at, for local producers to be able to use it to send the charcoal from the rural areas to the cities but also giving funding to chalk to urban merchants because one of the issues the 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 the, the, um, the strategy of reforming this reform, the chocolate reform in senegal was to try to, to to break this monopoly and one of the options was to, okay, to propose to urban merchants to work on other issues like conditioning of charcoal, um, processing, or, 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 or I mean, controlling the distribution in the cities rather than the controlling the production stage. And would, they would leave the production stage to the villagers. So that's why one of those points were, were, I mean, those decision was also taken by this project. Um, they would also help urban merchants to diversify their activities, not only just work on charcoal, but also work on other businesses um, to reduce their monopoly on the charcoal sector. Uh, another point was the diversification of household cooking fuel with the Jatofa oil production, but also the fabrication of charcoal briquettes from rice residues and tifa, but also the construction of biogas. Another point was the promotion of energy efficient stoves initiatives. So if we look at the, the charcoal reform since it has been started in 1997 to, to date, uh, when you do this, the, the, the uh, study on the charcoal sector and try to see how who is who is this, this reform benefiting to. So in 2018, I did a study. You now it's Sen who did a study for the World Bank, and the result was the seven seven percent of the benefit. I mean, the, of the of the of the money flows in the charcoal sector went to the local producers. That was the lo local people who has been being helped by the project to enter the charcoal market, while 93% was still in the hands of urban nations. I did a study in 2016, part of the, an evaluation of an assessment of a project funded by, the, by ESID. And my results were almost the same, 8% to the local people, while 92% went to the, to the, I mean, oh no, it was 8% access to the urban market for local people, while 92% was selling Forest edge price at forest, forest edge prices because they couldn't enter, enter the, the urban market. Problems of transportation, but also control mon the monopoly that the, the union, the major unions has on markets. On... For example, if you look at here, that was the, the much based on my calculation in 2013, the last I have done. So you see the mean benefit of a profit of a regular merchant was about three, 17. 17,000 US dollars per year. 
while the other actors were gaining this. Now look at this, the local producers are about, are, have been gaining about 6, 600 US dollars. And this, is, this was really the mean because many of them was gaining very less, just producing checkers to solve functional, I mean, regular problems. I mean, for example, if they have a wedding or something like that, they would produce 20 sacks of charcoal or 30 and sell it to, to, to urban merchants who would send it to the cities. So what are the mechanisms that shape access to charcoal and benefit? So first is unfair distribution of licenses to merchants. If you want to be a merchant or have a merchant's cooperative, you need to have a license from the government. From the government. So the distribution of the licenses is one of the problems here because it is based on your personal relation most it's not transparent at all. It's mostly based on your personal relation with people working on the post services or your net of your social capital. I mean, your, your capacity to mobilize politicians to help you act, have that license. So if you don't have a license, you can't be a mission. That's first. Second is the, the distribution of quota, the, 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 the quota for production issue. For example, the quota is set. So it says, okay, the forest have this potential. We're going to produce, for example, uh, 500,000 um, cantos of charcoal. So this quota is distributed among the, the existing or the, the licensed urban merchants. So the, the, the size of your quota will depend on your also on your network and your capacity to mobilize uh, to, to mobilize all the Asian all the first Asian or politicians or to, to pay for to pay for it and a lot of corruption also. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Papa, can, can you wrap up? Because we would really like to spend the last 15 minutes on questions. Yeah, I can. So we have just one last slide, please. Mm -hmm. uh, very fast. Just, uh, I didn't talk about the mechanism that shaped the power. So the, the first is the forest management, the forest management plan itself. Now, before the forest management plan was expanded in Senegal, so the dollar said, if you want to produce chocolate in a given rural jurisdictions, you need to have permission also from the elected local government. Now that we have the forest management plan, the forest management plan imposes the uses because it determines which kind of use are eligible, and you don't need permission from no longer you need. From, I mean, they no longer you no longer need permission from elected local government. So the power is taken off based on scientific scientific or technical argument saying this is the way you should produce with a lot of technical uh, regulation imposed. But also the second and the last one that I would say, which is really important, is the, the ministerial order, which is issued issue that say it is organizing the charcoal production. So the law has, the, the forestry court has already organized the way it is going to be produced. The charcoal is produced, but they still issue a ministerial order each year to define the ways in which charcoal is going to, pro to be produced, who is going to be, have access and the condition of charcoal production. I, I will stop, I will, Stop there until the discussion, leave the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm sorry to have to interrupt you, but we really do want to hear questions from the audience. And uh, I will start with um, one question that sort of come up over and over again in the chat or in, in multiple times in the chat. And I think it's a really important one. So, uh, so far we have seen uh, examples, all the examples have pointed to uh, to a kind of reform that's uh, led by the central government. Uh, it thinks of the whole country as, as, um, as, as uh, the space in which the reform needs to take place. And there are questions about, is this necessarily the case? Are there examples in which uh, reform really happens at a much more sub-national level? Um, are you aware of those? And, 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 and why would that be perhaps a better, a better approach? Uh, given all the problems that all of you have highlighted uh, with reform when it's implemented sort of at national level. So um, maybe um, Professor Mwok, if you can start with uh, any examples that you know from, uh, from sub-national level, and then uh, if any of the other panelists can pitch in, that'd be great. Professor? Yes, yeah. Uh, I think we have a, a really good example from, from Kenya case. Uh, as I mentioned that uh, 
initially there was a, this uh, committee, the national committee, that was looking at, at as a biofuel policy and bioenergy policy, and they did a good work and produced the strategy. But lately, with the with the with the devolved system in Kenya, we have the county system, more of the, more, more of the federal, federal systems, and the different counties are also coming up with their own arrangements. And uh, what happens is that, uh, and that's it, just just to, to look at the looking at the national level will be fast then you can now you know devolve it to the other level but if you start from the lower level then it becomes a problem so there was this country here in the western eastern kenya is kitui and they did very well they had their check regulation and they even started burning you know vehicles moving from other part of the country or, or the country carrying charcoal and what happened is that the other countries the people from the other countries also started waiting for vehicle for vehicles for that from that country that county to revenge, so it brought several revenge, and people were burning vehicles. So, to me, I, I think that um, well, as much as we need to have a bottom-up approach, bottom-up approach should mean that uh, this harmonized system at the central, and that harmonized system now bring everybody on board. But if we look at different parts of the country are doing different things, and I think that is a type of disharmony that we are seeing across the region, even from state one state to another. One state is burning, the other state is not burning. And then people are just transferring problem from one place to another. That's the way I look at it. Thank you. Um, Shia, or, or would you like to add to that? Well, a quick, quick example to share is that I know some of my colleagues have been working in, in Zambia trying to introduce trying to introduce a concept of the charcoal Producers Association at uh, the provincial or the uh, prefecture level and also you know, how to work with the communities uh, with the government to introduce this kind of participatory guarantee system this is kind of ongoing effort thank you thank you uh, some somebody's <laughs> Uh, I, this this is a really good point. Uh, I can't see the name of exactly who put it out there, but they say you know central governments are perhaps overestimated as uh, as the sources of solutions. They don't own most of the land. They tend to be you know far away from where um, the, the the problems are, uh, very removed. Um, and say maybe people are the solutions. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to put that out there because I think it, it feeds into this particular particular topic. Um, particular theme that we're covering. Um, the other, the other question. So, so um, a couple of best practices were were mentioned, uh, particularly by Professor Mwok and and this consultative process that Kenya has has uh, has um, implemented to develop this the new bioenergy uh, strategy. Um, Papa Fai, you mentioned uh, the the unions and sort of the more uh, people powered, so to speak, uh, uh, organizations that have formed to try to influence um, what what happens in that sector and to maintain power and monopolies. Uh, it it's, it seems is there c c I've given all these experiences? Can any of you? Um, provides like some kind of examples of things working that as a result of this reform something working uh, something improving uh, more revenue coming in or, or or people having better access to forests can, can we get some uh, good example out there of, of success yes uh, uh, we have some burgeoning like outcomes here like the villagers who've been organized by the by some of the project, funded the word by the World Bank or USID, are now regrouping to a network of charcoal producers to become really merchants. And they <coughs> when the they're also claiming that because they live around nearby the forest, they would care more, I mean better this force than the urban merchants, the urban merchants who really control have been controlling the, the, the sector. And now they, they are becoming strong because they are uh, gathered into a national federation of local producers. And they're also gaining support by, by the donors. 
who environmental who are working in the environmental sector, the World Bank, mainly the World Bank here in Senegal. And I think this is something that is going that could shift the relations or at least break the monopoly of the, the private sector, or let's say the, the merchants at some point. And, and the advantage of this is the, it would it, the impact of that in rural poverty alleviation. I think this is something that is really interesting. Um, and yes, but the problem is the limitation. I mean, the, the, the fact that the forest service uh, imposes where charcoal is produced. It's, so you don't decide where, to, where you want to produce charcoal. Even if there is a forest around your village, you don't decide where, to, where you can do charcoal production there. So everything will depend on decision from the forest service when they have a forest management plan. So if you don't have a forest man management plan, you can't produce charcoal production in your forest. So that's the only intention. But I think the, the, the idea of joining together to be able to influence decision making is something that is strong here. Yeah, maybe, maybe another case that I could mention earlier, I mentioned the case of uh, participatory forest management in Kenya that was introduced. And through that, uh, the communities around the forest form the, uh, the Community Forest Association. And within the Community Forest Association, which actually is recognized by the law, then became, became more of a legal you know, entity because they are recognized. And within this association, then they have user groups. And the, the user group, they have you know, like energy user group. This happens around the Mount Kenya region, which I, I found was really working. And uh, the energy user group, apart from using, check, using charcoal, burning charcoal you know, in a more sustainable way, they also went ahead into look at alternative fuel. Like uh, I know they were installing biogas digesters in small scale in, in, farmer, in farmers uh, in household. And this uh, actually relieved uh, the, the forest from the extra exploration, destruction due to, to charcoal. So I, I thought this also uh, is still in the early stages, but these were actually the for, for front runners in the, in the user groups on how they're using energy. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there is also um, something that uh, none of you really mentioned, but in, if you look at the literature and particularly some of the work that uh, Jolien Shura has done and, um, and Zulu, in, in, mostly in West Africa, uh, they have shown over and over again how um, when you introduce reform, you also um, tend to undercut local informal institutions and systems that work. Um, and, and so you introduce this other, this other top, uh, other system that, that removes uh, a system that already exists uh, and works. So in, in, in any of your work, and particularly you, uh, uh, Papa Five, uh, could, could you, have you seen that? Could you um, give us a sense of what that looks like? And, and, um, and, and, and basically talk a little bit to this, to this topic, because it does come up a lot, certainly in the academic literature. Yes, uh, I have done some work with somebody, uh, Stephen Denison, for his, and he's an American forest Asian uh, expert to say. We've done some work for the USAID in Washington DC uh, to look at these alternative ways of wood fuels, wood fuel sourcing in Senegal. It, I mean, apart from the the formal one, the one that is controlled by the Forest Service. Um, because one of the aspects was to see effectively how, how the, the, the reform of the charcoal sector is at least uh, blocking other initiatives that have been working at the local level. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, there is, I mean, charcoal product, there is, was, as can, let me say, such a local arrangement for charcoal production in many areas in Senegal especially in the central region where charcoal has started. I mean, let's say, because it is now in the south, but it was in Dakar, in the west, then in the central, now you are in the south. The south. So they, they had some experiences of, <coughs> of regulating charcoal production uh, with the village chief. A village chief is not really a chief, it's just the, the someone who's heading the village <laughs> in Senegal, because I always make that explanation because it's very different from the industry. In Central Africa, for example, who is uh, somebody who's administrative authority at the village level, and who has been giving, who have been giving authorization or permission to villagers to to go in the forest and regulate. 
um, do charcoal production. It was really regulated at a local level and the ways which, which types of spaces had, uh, was uh, allowed for charcoal production, not all the, all the spaces, three spaces. Uh, so this was clearly um, good initiatives there, organized informally, but unfortunately with the reform, those ha are not able to unfold actually because it's, it's considered an ir irregular charcoal to date based on the new regulations. Thank you, thank you. And, and with that, we really uh, have to end our, our session. We're really sorry that uh, we weren't able to cover all the questions. As Sylvia has indicated in the chat and, be, and at the beginning, um, the panelists will answer all of your questions in, um, there will be a process where we'll, we'll, they, they'll answer them and, and we will send those to you together with the, all the presentations that you saw today. We just wanted to thank you so much uh, to um, Gia, to Professor Mwok, to Papa for, for your presentations and for sharing your experiences here today. Thank you all of you for, for uh, taking the time to join us in this uh, discussion. We just wanted to let you know that there are a couple more webinars coming up uh, for the rest of the year. The next one is uh, on the 21st of July on Kiln Technologies. And then later we'll have one on the global trade in charcoal and, um, and other topics uh, running into 2022. We also wanted to uh, highlight a really important conference that's coming up in November that's being organized by a consortium of organizations, including the University of Copenhagen, um, that will take place between the 23rd and 25th of November 2021. It could be virtual, it could be um, uh, in person, but the point is here is a conference that is dedicated just to wood fuels and it's still possible to submit uh, abstracts uh, until the 1st of June. Uh, here's a web page, um, go ahead and do that. And a couple more conferences coming up at the end of the year on issues in which charcoal could be uh, related. One on, by the Ecosystem Service Partnership, uh, looking at how ecosystems can continue to provide services, goods and services um, into the future in Africa. And uh, back to back to that one, uh, also in, in Rwanda is the International Congress on Conservation Biology that is increasingly also looking at all the other multiple dimensions of um, what it means to conserve, conserve what for who and so forth, and, and good opportunity to uh, to bring in the charcoal discussion there as well. So thank you.